Hello there. You're welcome. This is your revision show on your joy learning channel. I have the great pleasure of bringing you another rich mathematics experience. Today we shall be discussing a very important topic in mathematics. And this is particularly geared towards those of you in your final year. Well, your paper is a few days from today and I hope to help you crunch a few figures and hopefully we shall overcome. My name is Danso and tonight our topic is calculus. Does it put some fear in you? Calculus. Well, if you're in your first or second year in school and you have never heard that topic before or never treated it before, never mind. You will get to learn a few things. You may not understand everything today, but I bet you, you would get a few very important concepts you can carry along as you journey on your path in mathematics. For the final year students, well, this is going to be a revision. So what that means is we shall go a little faster than usual. By the way, calculus as a topic is quite broad. Broad because calculus is like the convergence of at least 60% of most of the mathematical concepts that you would ever come across. And so most things have to be tackled from that point of view that so many things meet at this one topic. Well, that doesn't make it confusing. It just means that mathematics makes sense because it meets somewhere. Well, where does calculus come from? The word calculus is of Latin origin. It actually means literally bones or pebbles. Pebbles. Why pebbles? Why pebbles? Well, it's because pebbles or like stones were the basic, um, if you like, instruments used for computation. So to add, the ancient Romans would pick pebbles to represent quantities. Those quantities were then either added or subtracted or whatever operation they needed to perform was performed using those pebbles. And so calculus is borrowed from that literal translation. And so we say we calculate. That means we compute. So calculus is a computational thing. Well, calculus as we know it today was put together strongly by two people. And this history is important to understand calculus. These two people independently researched calculus, wrote about it, really not knowing that either of them were working on it. These two people I refer to are Sir Isaac Newton of England and that very sharp mind, Gottlieb Wilhelm Leibniz of Germany. These two men thought about calculus in two different ways. What did they think about? For Isaac Newton, Sir Isaac Newton, he thought of calculus in, the term, in terms of shapes. So he dealt with it geometrically. Well, he also did not think of sharing his ideas with others initially. So he wrote exactly for himself. On the other hand, Gottlieb Wilhelm Leibniz considered sharing his thoughts with others. So he was deliberate in his writings. Little wonder, a lot of the notations we will find out in calculus stems from him because he was deliberate about them. So we will dive into the topic. What do we intend to achieve together this evening? Well, we intend th three things. Number one, that you will be able to use the concept of limits to determine derivatives of simple polynomial or if you like algebraic functions as well as trigonometric functions. So in calculus, there are basically three things we'll be considering. We'll be considering limits, differentiation, and integration. So the first thing we'll be trying to do together is to understand how to use limits to find the derivatives of algebraic 
or trigonometric functions. And please note the term functions. I'll speak about them in a bit. Secondly, I'll be hoping that together we'll be able to differentiate and integrate simple functions using the rules of calculus. And there are a few rules. Hopefully, if you're in your final year and you have treated it in school, then you have an idea. If you have never touched it, today, tonight, will be a good opportunity to familiarize yourself with them. If you have treated it but you never really understood it, this is yet another opportunity to get it. Finally, we shall be applying differentiation and integration principles to practical everyday problems. And this is where math becomes fun. All right, let's dive in. A few terms to consider. And there are a few terms. These terms, you must get familiar with them. Limits is inescapable. You would always meet limits as the precursor, the beginning, the foundation to anything calculus. Why? Let's pause here and understand a few things. Calculus stems from functions. What are functions? Functions are rules that associate one mem member or members of a non-empty set with another non-empty set. What do we mean by that? Now, you recall that we, in, a previous, in previous lessons, we talked about functions. And functions are from relations. Now, you have a brother, you have a sister. If you have neither because you're an only child, it means you have a mother at least and a father. Now, there is a relationship between you and that other person you call mother or the other person you call father. If you are in school, then you have classmates. So there is a relationship. You have a teacher or teachers. Well, hopefully you are not doing self-learning. Even if you are, you are related to that unknown person by their works. So that is a relationship. Mathematics tries to understand relationships between two non-empty sets. So in trying to understand that, you must have treated something called mapping, and you treated something called the rules of mapping. That was in your core math class. Well, we moved on from there to functions, where we could define that relationship in very clear mathematical terms. So we would say, for example, f of x is equal to something, or y equals something, or f is such that x maps to something. That was the defining relationship. Now, what we try to understand is, for example, and that is another topic that meets in calculus. That is the concept of variation. So, for example, you're a student, and if you're watching me, in all likelihood, you, you're catered for by a parent. Well, your parents give you money. I assume you are a boarding student. Maybe you are not, even a day student because your school is in the nature of a day student, or of, of a day school. So you go to school on the, on the benevolence, on the blessings of your parents or your guardians. So I expect that they give you some money. Well, the amount of money you take to school depends very largely on how much your parents earn. Now, if they earn more, there is a chance you would get more to school. If they earn less, you will get less. So for example, we are in Ghana, and let me use the Ghanaian currency. If you're in Nigeria, I could have used the Naira or the Leon if I was in Sierra Leone. Now, just think about the figures in terms of your country's currency, just in case you're watching outside of Ghana. But I'm in Ghana, so I'm using the Ghanaian cities. So your parents earn a thousand Ghana cities, say per month. And every month, you are given a hundred Ghana cities. Now, if your parents' income increased to, say, 2,000 Ghana cities, there is a chance your own pocket money would increase from 100 Ghana cities to maybe 200 Ghana cities. If their pocket money, if their own salaries or incomes increase to, say, 3,000 Ghana cities, there is a chance, chance that you could get 300 Ghana cities. So you notice there is a relationship between the amount of money your parents earn and the amount you get. There is a certain relationship. Well, in other kind of math, we'll call it a correlation. 
So they are correlated. So the income of your parents is related to how much you get as pocket money. Now, think about it this way. If your parents, maybe you are the only child at the time, but then you get a cousin or a brother, somebody your parents adopt into the family, all of a sudden, your 100 or 200 cities get abstracted because your parents have the same amount they have to share it between you and this cousin or whomsoever they have brought into the house. So there is a relationship. So what calculus attempts to do is to try and understand from the perspective of algebra what happens when these changes occur. So we try to understand those changes. So what happens as a certain value gets closer and closer to a certain other value? We call that limits. So let's go back to our terms. Limits. The limit of a function or a sequence is the value that sequence approaches or the value the function approaches as that value approaches another value. Now, because we do not have figures here, you might not understand it, but when we get to figures, you will get it. So that's the first thing, limits. Second is the derivatives. The derivatives. Think of derivatives in terms of refinery. So crude oil is refined and we get, say, gasoline or we get petrol, liquefied, something from the fractional distillation of crude oil. That is a derivative. It's something we obtain. So derivatives in mathematics is what we obtain from a function. So it is the rate of a function, the rate of change of a function with respect to a given variable. Notice the, the, the words with respect to underlined, with respect to. Every time there is a change, it is with respect to something. So your pocket money changes with respect to your parents' income. So there is one that is the um, independent variable, which occurs of its own accord, and there is the dependent variable that occurs because of the other's occurrence or what happens to the other. So what happens if your parents' salary or income increases or decreases? What would happen to your own pocket money? That is a derivative. If we're able to find that rate of change, we say we have found the derivative. But we will do this in the context of algebra. Remember, a function will be an algebraic statement. Then we talk about differentiation. Differentiation, look at the word difference. It just means it's a process like its other neighbor, integration. They are both processes. Differentiation is the process of finding the derivative. So if we want to find the derivative of a function, we say we are differentiating. Well, in, in more advanced levels of calculus, we'll call that differential calculus. Well, integration is the reverse of, integration, of differentiation. So when we differentiate, we find a derivative. When we integrate, we find a function. So if we want to find what we can get out of crude oil, that process, mathematically speaking, will be differentiation. Whereas integration will be, say we have petrol, now we want to get it back to crude oil, that is integration. Integration is putting things together. So think about it this way. It's a funny way of thinking about it, but it's true. Think about boiling an egg. And we want to unboil the egg. Well, to unboil the egg, that process will be a process of integration. All right, so let's get into limits proper. We would invest some time into limits because this is the crux of the matter. The limit of a function at a point A is the value the function approaches as the argument of the function approaches a certain value A. So we have a limit. Limit is a boundary. How far can it get to? So that notation on your screen, L-I-M, means limit. F with X in parentheses is read F of X or the function F of F. And beneath the LIM, the limit, you have a notation X with an arrow A. The A is in red. Now, it means it is read this way. The limit of the function F of X as X approaches or tends to A. The limit of F of X as X approaches A. What do we mean by that? So, say we have a function F of X. 
given by that reciprocal function 1 over x. What will happen if the argument is substituted using different increasing or decreasing values? Let's see to what extent would it get to. Let's illustrate that quickly. So let's say we have the function and x, which is the argument, is given value say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. What will happen? Now at this point, if you have a calculator by you, it will be a great learning experience. What I would like you to do is to try with your notebook by your side, a pen or a pencil, try replacing or substituting for the values of x. So wherever there is x, put 1. And then on your calculator, or if you can do it mentally, 1 on 1, you should get 1. 1 on 2, you should get 0 0.5. 1 on 3, you should get 0 0.3333 recurring. 1 on 4, you should get 0 0.25. 1 on 5, you should get 0 0.2, and so on and so forth. Now, look at what I have on my table. I have used different values, beginning from 1, x1, all the way to x being 1,000. Now, you would observe that when I have x as 1 and I put it into the function f of x equals to 1 over x, for 1, I get 1. For 2, I get 0 0.5. In other words, 1 over 2 gives me 0 0.5. 1 on 3 gives me 0 0.333 recurring. I have left it in two decimal places. 1 on 4 is 0 0.25. 1 on 5 is 0 0.20. Now, observe something. Do you notice that on the second row of that table, the lighter part of the table, you have 1, 0 0.5, 0 0.33, and you observe it keeps decreasing. By the time x is 1,000, 1,000, we have f of x as 0 0.001. If I increase x to say 10,000, it will become even smaller. Really, it gets to a point where it disappears and almost becomes zero, but never really gets to zero. Now, if we come to a break period in the course of this presentation, I would love you to test something if you can. So for example, between 1 and 2, we have our f of x as 1 and 0 0.5. I want you to just add value, say 0 0.1 to 1, so you get 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1 1.3, all the way to say 1.9. You would observe that as you do that, the value of 1 on x gets closer and closer to 0 0.5, but never really gets there. Let's test another example to illustrate the point even further. So, I have 1. Now, I am re re reducing it, decreasing it, instead of increasing like in the first case, 1, 0 0.9, 0 0.8. And I have reduced it so much that I get to the point 0 0.001. Now, you look at the values on the second row. You will notice it's 1, 0 0.00, 1 1.11. How did I get 1.11? 1 divided by 0 0.9. Now, the 1.11 is just two decimal places. All right. So, 1 on 8, 0 0.8 gives me 1.25. By the time I get to 1 divided by 0 0.001, that's the last column, last row, I get 1,000. What does that tell you? That as the values of x keeps decreasing and decreasing to the point where it is almost 0, the value of 1 on x becomes so large, it becomes infinite, becomes really, really large. So you notice that for a function like 1 on f of x equal to 1 on x, what you do to the values of x will create a certain value for f of x. We call that value to which it tends to the limit of the function. That is the boundary, the extent to which that will go. Now, the value would never be infinity in the second case or um, zero as in the first case, but it will get very close to. We call that the asymptote. In other words, it's so close but never really there. Very close but never really there. In the Ghanaian parlance, we will say, your, your eyes will see Canaan, but your feet will not step in there. That's what happens with a limit. It, it shows you how close the thing that the function will get to, how far it will get. Now, let's see a few examples on this. So, given a function f of x equals 2x plus 3, for example, the limit of that function as x approaches a certain value called a will be 2 multiplied by a 
plus 3. So 2a plus 3. Now let's give a a value. So let's say that a is negative 1. What happens to that function? What happens to the function f of x equals 2x plus 3? The function gets close and close to 1 because by substituting negative 1 into that function, we have negative 2 plus 3, which gives us negative 1. What it means is that this function will get very close to 1, never really 1, so we have an idea what is going to happen. Now, that is the concept of limits. And just to take a, a little pause here, may I quickly add that the idea of functions is so critical to the calculus that it's inescapable. There are two kinds of functions we'll be dealing with primarily today, as I mentioned in the introduction. Our functions will be algebraic functions and trigonometric fun functions. In other words, functions that are algebraic in nature and other functions that are more or less angular. So, sine, cosine, tangent. All right. Now, let's note a few things. When you try to find the limit of a function, and that function is a constant, the limit will be the constant. So the limit of, say, 4 as x tends to any value is immaterial because it's a constant. It will not change. There's no limit. to It is what it is. You, you, you are not going to change it because it doesn't depend on anything. So the limit of a constant is a constant. That is something to note. All right. Now, if a function f of x is such that it is rational, a rational number, you know, ordinarily is a number that can be written as a ratio of two numbers. So if it's a rational function, it means that it is one function divided by another function. So say f of x is defined by g of x divided by h of x, then the limit of f of x is actually, I mean, as x tends to a, is the limit of g of x as x tends to a, divided by the limit of h of x as x tends to a. This is provided that none of the limits is equal to zero. What happens if any one of them will be zero on their own? Well, then the original function, which is rational, must be simplified. Don't worry if it sounds like too, too much of um, technicalities. A few examples will clear everything. So remember, number one, the limit of a constant is the constant itself. Number two, if the function is rational, in other words, one function divided by another function, then the limit of that function is the limit of the individual ratios, I mean parts of the ratios, so long as none of them yields zero. If any of them will yield zero, you must first simplify the function. So let's take a few examples. Say you're given to evaluate these three functions, the limit of x squared minus 4 all on x plus 2 as x tends to negative 2. If you're in your first or second year watching me, learn how it is said. If you're in your final year and you never learned how to say it, this is a good time to learn it. It is the limit of x squared minus 4 all on x plus 2 as x approaches or tends to negative 2. Question B says the limit of x squared plus 10x plus 21 all on x squared minus 9 as x tends to negative 3. And the final one says the limit of 4 minus x on 2 minus the square root of x as x tends to negative 2. Let's pick them one at a time. So, the first, if you observe to the left, the original question, we have x squared minus 4. Now, if you're an elective math student, generally as a math student, you must not only look, you must see. Well, you look with your eyes, but you see with your mind. If you looked, you should have seen that that's a difference. The numerator is a difference of two squares. And by the law of difference of two squares, x squared minus 4, we yield x minus 2 multiplied by x plus 2 on the numerator. Now, why did we have to do that? Now, imagine there was no right side of this solution. 
Imagine there was only the left side. And we tried substituting for x in the original equation. You would notice that at this point, if we put in x minus 2 here, or as negative 2, I beg your pardon, you would have negative 2 plus 2, and that will yield 0 immediately. And you know that by the law of mathematics, anything divided by 0 will yield an undefined solution. So we have to cater for that. And finally, yes, students, please note in your objective, I mean, multiple choice problems, these are the kind of questions you would encounter. It is often the case that they expect you or they hope, when I say they, I refer to the examiners, they test, they want to test your ability to recognize this problem and deal with it. If you replace it with negative 2 instantly, you would be wrong. And you might not even realize you're wrong because there will be an answer that fits what you have done. All right, so we deal with the num numerator. You, ex you, you, you factorize it. And when you have factored them out, what happens is we can now divide and take out x plus 2, x plus 2. Well, what we'll be left with will be lim the limit of x minus 2. That is what was left here. So now we can find the limit. In other words, we can replace x or substitute x with negative 2. So we now have negative 2 minus 2 equals negative 4. In other words, the limit of the original function x squared minus 4 all on x plus 2 as x tends to negative 2 is negative 4. In other words, as x gets closer and closer to negative 2, the whole limit, the whole function gets close and close to negative 4. I hope this is getting home to you. We shall perform a few drills shortly and the phone lines will be open. But let's go through the, the other two. Right. The same with this instance. In this instance, you are not only factorizing the numerator, the denominator is also factored. Remember, if f of x is rational and by substituting the values of the limit or the argument, you get a zero, then you have to factorize. That was the last thing I asked you to note. So when we factorize x squared plus 10x plus 21, we get x plus 7, x plus 3. If you're in your first or second year and you do not know how this occurred, I would encourage you to visit the Joy Learning TV channel on YouTube and please go over the topic quadratic functions. There we treat how to deal with this particular matter. It's a real number problem and algebra issue. All right, now when we factorize the numerator, the denominator also becomes x minus 3, x plus 3 multiplied. Again, like we did in the first instance, and as you can see on your screen, we strike out x plus 3. And having struck out those, we now we are left with this, x plus 7 on x minus 3. At this point, we can substitute. Sorry, what you have there should not be log. It should be limit. All right. So if we substitute for x, we have negative 3 plus 7 and negative 3 minus 3. We end up with 4 on negative 6, which is the same thing as negative 2 on 3. So the limit of that whole function, x squared plus 10, x plus 21, all on x squared minus 9, as x tends to negative 3, is negative 2 on 3. Easy does it, not so. All right. Let's deal with the third one. The limit of 4 minus x all on 2 minus the square root of x as x tends to 4. Again, if we substituted straight away 4 into this, we would end up having 2 minus 2. And that will lead us to 0. So again, we have to deal with it. But this time around, you notice we have a third. We have the square root of what may be a real number. So it's a third. And when you have a square root or a root sign in the denominator, you have to rationalize it. So we rationalize it by conjugating, which is something else. To conjugate, it just means multiply numerator and denominator by this same thing except for the sign. The sign changes from negative to positive. So here it's positive, whereas here it's negative. So we multiply both the numerator and the denominator by that. When we do that, what will happen essentially is that the denominator will lose the radical sign. 
So we would end up having something like this. And from here again, we can strike out 4 minus x. By the way, just for the final year students again, note that when a problem is given to you this way, what it actually means is that you will be able to take out something. It's deliberately designed that way. So never mind. Just make sure you get, if you notice at the end of your rationalization that you do not have something with which to divide, it is likely you have not done something right. So you may have to take a step backwards. That's just a free tip. All right. So when we are done with that, we have the limit of 2 plus the square root of x as x tends to 4. At this point, we can simply substitute and we would have 2 plus root 4. You could leave your answer this way if you want. You could, um, well, you can change it because square root of 4 is 2 and it's known. So 2 plus 2 will give you 4. But if it was square root of, say, 5, you could leave your answer that way. All right, so we are done here. So a few things to note about limits, then we do our drills. The limit of f of x, as the argument becomes extremely large, so instead of just a, as it becomes very large, that's that symbol, the lambskate. It looks like an 8, 10 sideways. A few things to note about it. If the value becomes extremely large, if we keep increasing it, and it becomes extremely large, what will happen? The first thing that happens is that if n, for example, the limit of x exponential n, as x tends to infinity, would not exist. It would not exist. Because it will become so large, imagine for one minute, that x was, say, 2. And we say 2 to the power 1, that would be 2. 2 to the power 2, 3. I mean, 2 to the power 2, 4. 2 to the power 3, 8. 2 to the power 5, 32. 2 to the power 6, well, 64. 2 to the power 10, 1,024, etc., etc. Now, what if n became 1,000? What will happen to 2 to the power 1,000? To become incredibly large. Incredibly large. So as x becomes very, very large, something happens. Well. And if it is positive, that is, if n is positive, then if we kept changing x instead of n, the same thing will happen. So instead of 2, if we made it 3 or 4 or 5, and we moved on and on to say x is 10,000, and 10,000 to the power, say, 6, that's humongous. So it will no longer exist. There will be no limits. It will be limitless, boundless. Well, math, we like to be able to define even the things, the realms we cannot understand. The second thing is, if the function f of x is rational, then the limit as that rational function, which is reciprocal, as x tends to infinity, it becomes zero. In other words, as we saw in the last table, as x becomes extremely large, and we have a function such as 1 over x exponent, say, n, then the function will become just zero. It just become closer and closer. Though it would never be zero, it would get very close to zero. All right. Finally, if the function is rational, so that f of x equals to g of x divided by h of x, then we simplify as we have done previously. So I'll leave it on the screen one minute so that, so that you take notes. So look at it again. The function does not exist if x keeps increasing so large. The base increases so large. If the function is reciprocal, irrational like that, 1 over 1 on x exponent n, and n is positive, then it will become 0. It will come close to 0. And if it is rational, then we have to simplify the function before we go ahead to find the limits. Okay. At this point, I'll give you a few examples. So the limit of 5 on x squared as x tends to infinity. If we substitute x with infinity, Infinity squared will simply be infinity. And 1 over infinity is really nothing, 0. So we have 0 there. Just that simple. As x increases and becomes extremely large, that whole function becomes very close to 0. It's asymptotic to 0. All right. What about the second case? We have 3x squared plus 10x plus 21, all divided by x squared plus 9. Now, the last instruction was if it is rational, then first divide it. Now, how do we divide it? A, sim a very quick one to note here. You would notice that I have divided the numerator and the denominator by a certain value. Watch. 
I have divided it consistently by x squared. All right. That is what to do. Always divide it by the highest power of the variable. So if it was x to the power 3 and it was the highest, I will divide each term, each term by that. If I divide it as I have, then I would have 3x squared divided by x squared would give me 3 because the x squared would divide out. 10x divided by x squared would give me 10 on x, and 21 divided by x squared would give me 21 on x squared. At the denominator, on, I'll have x squared divided by x squared, which is 1, and then 9 divided by x squared, which would give me actually x squared, not x there. Well, now the limit, recall that as x becomes very large, all of this will become 0. So I have 3 plus 0 plus 0. Remember what we had at the top here? Yeah, the same thing is applying down there. So we have 3 plus 0 plus 0, all on 1 plus 0. So that gives me 3 on 1, which is equal to 3. I guess this is clear enough. All right, if it is, these are our drills. The four lines will be open now. We have six questions on your screen. I'll leave you to try them, and let me hear from you if you've been able to capture this thought. Our phone lines are open Good evening, Emmanuel. Evening, sir. Emmanuel, you're welcome. Thank you, sir. Yes, so Emmanuel, we have six problems on your screen. Tell me which of them do you want to answer? Hello, Emmanuel. Do I have Emmanuel on the line? All right, I lost Emmanuel. So, we have six problems on the screen. Take a shot at any one of them you want to. Any one of them. Be daring enough. Give it a try. They cover everything we have discussed so far. So give it a try. Take a shot. Good evening, Emanuela. Yes, sir. Hello, good evening, Emanuela. Hello, sir. Yes, Emanuela, you're welcome to the show. Thank you. Where are you calling us from, Emanuela? Please, I'm talking from Sunyani. From Sunyani, that's great. So tell me, Emanuela, which of them do you want to answer? Oh, I lost Emanuela. It's like the company of Emmanuel's and Emmanuel's are not getting through. Who do I have on the line? Good evening. Good evening, please. My name is Majid Alassan. Your name is? Majid Alassan. Majid, you're welcome. Yes. So, Ma 
So, Majid, which of them do you want to answer? Oh, please, I want to answer number two. All right, you great. Want... Go ahead, Majid. Okay. Okay, then number two, it seems it's somehow like differences of two squares. All right. So, we have x square, and then we have, uh, we have, it is 16, right? My yes, height. yes, that's 16. Okay, so it will be four squares. All right. And then, difference of two squares, we, we will have something like uh, x, x plus 4 and then x minus 4. Uh, you left something out. Check it again. Uh, the, the denominator, right? No, the numerator. You said something. I, I guess you have written it, but you said it. Please, can, can you zoom the, this, this thing out? All right. Uh, can you zoom it out? Okay, Majid but, wants the screen zoomed so that he can see the figures well. Uh, yes, yes, yes. All right, so let's zoom in for Majid. Well, I'm, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. Okay, okay. So, Majid, can you see it now? Yes, I can see it. So, okay. we, have, we have X with the power, uh, X with the power 2, right? Yes, please. Yes, now you get it. Yes. So, X with the power 2 minus 4 with the power 2. Yes. All over, x raised the power 2 minus 2 raised the power 2. All right. Uh -huh. So, for the top one, you do your difference of two squares. Yes. So, you get something like x plus 4, and then all in brackets, and then x minus 4, all in brackets as well. Okay. And then Ma Majid, Majid, can I interrupt you briefly? Okay, sir. M Majid, do me a favor. It's always great a great idea to write what you are trying to say. If you write it down, you will notice you would not make a mistake. You have made the same mistake twice. Okay, and that's okay. because you've not written it. So try writing out what you want to say. Okay, 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 okay. Great, Thank thanks, down. Majid. By the way, where are you calling from? I'm calling from Eastern Region. What, what part of the Eastern Region? Please, I'm, I'm at Apeja. Apeja, that's great. So okay. try it again and call back. So give us okay. the final answer. What will be the limit of that function? When you are done, I'll be listening. Okay, okay, okay. Great. Thank you, Thanks, sir. Majid. Okay, sir. Bye. Bye. Yes. Still waiting for somebody to take a shot and get it correct. Majid was close, except that Majid was trying to... Uh... Hello, good evening. Hello, good evening. Who do I have on the line? Please, my name... Hello. Yeah, hello. I can hear you. Good evening. Good evening. Yes, who do I have on the line? Abna. Abna, you're welcome to the show. Thank you very much. So, Abna, where are you calling us from? I'm calling from Abu Sultan. Oh, fantastic. So, Abna, um, I will ask your school later, but tell me, which of the questions did you want to answer? This is the first one. All right, great. So, Abna, what do you have for the ans answer to the first one? Please ask 16. 16. Yes. Abna, I agree with you. 16 is the answer. 16 is the answer. Thank you, Abna. By the way, what school do you attend, Abna? Ab Take that again, Abna. Hello? Hello? Oh. Sorry, I did not get that. Your line was breaking. Accra Girls Senior High School. Oh, great. Accra Girls Senior High School. Are you a final year student? Yes, please. Oh, great. Do you, you take elective maths, I suppose? Yes, please. All the best when you write on the 8th of September. Thank on the night, I beg your pardon. All right, thanks. I've not get question one right. The answer is 16. All right. We have... Fa Hello, good evening. Hello. Hello, good evening. Hello. Yes, hello, good evening. Hello. Oh, I can hear you. Good evening. Good evening. Yes, you're welcome to the show. Thank you, sir. What's your name, sir? My name is Abbas. Abbas. Great. Yeah. Abbas, there were six... There are six problems on your screen. Which of them do you want to attempt? Question three. Question three. Great. So what do we do with question three? Question three. First of all, you work the quadratic equation first. Oh, great. Which of them is the quadratic? Work the quadratic equation. Which of them is the quadratic? The down one. The, the, the denominator. Great. Uh, so so, so what is your final answer when you're done? I got one over minus three. 1 over minus 3. Abbas. Yes, sir. Abbas, take, a, take another look at it, okay? Okay. Take another look at it. 
All right, Abbas was giving number three a shot, but Abbas was not quite there. Emmanuel, good evening. Yes. Good evening, Emmanuel. Good evening, sir. Is this Emmanuel from Takrade? Uh, Emmanuel from Takrade. Yes, Emmanuel, you're welcome. Thank you, sir. I was expecting to hear from you. Okay, sir, I'm answering question three. All right, Emmanuel, go ahead with question three. He said the uh, lower part is quadratic. Sure. And you need to factorize that one. When I factorize, I got x minus five in x. X minus five one bracket. Yes. And x minus one in another bracket. Yeah. So the x minus one the numerator will cancel the one in the denominator. Sure. So when I put it, I got negative one over three. Negative one on. Negative one over three. Emma, do I have to disagree with you? No, I think you're right. Thank you very much, Emma. Emma, Emma, thank you very much, Emmanuel. So, number one and number three out of the way. Who is giving us another shot? I'll give maybe two more callers and we'll resolve all of these together. And please... Do not be afraid of them. Take them as they remember the rules. If they are just linear like question one, all you do is substitute them. If they are rational, anything from question two to question five, you simplify them before you substitute. Good evening, Daniel. Good evening. Daniel, where are you calling us from? Oh, awesome. All right, Daniel, you're welcome. So, Daniel, what school do you attend? I'm calling from Pempekali. Wow, that's great. Are you a final year student? No, please. What? Second year. Second year. Oh, that's still great. That's nice. So, Daniel, which of the questions do you want to try? Question four. Question four. Tell me, what do you have for question four? Uh, I had, it doesn't exist. The limit does not exist. For question four? Yes. Why doesn't it exist? Uh, where, where do you substitute? Then I'm uh, x approaching to one into the function. Okay, uh, so you have um, Daniel. Yes. You have fallen into the trap that quote and unquote we we put for you. You do not substitute immediately. Now, Daniel, look at the top numerator. It has three x squared minus five x plus two, right? Yes. Please. The moment you see that, it should give you an idea that you should first of all factorize, factorize the numerator. Yeah. So if you factorize it, and the denominator can also be factorized because it's a difference of two squares. So I'm giving out the clues. Then something would divide out something and you will not get that situation. So take another look at it. All right. All right, great. Let me call you back there and answer again. Yes, that would be fantastic. All right. I would love to linger here because, yes, all right. Hello, good evening. Oh, I lost that caller. All right. Let's try and trash all of this out. Let me give you a fair idea. Now, I'll take you back to the screen, and I want you to observe something here. Let's do it together. I'll go to question number two. Question number two, Abbas was trying to do something. This is what Abbas was attending to, attempting to do. X to the power four minus 16 can be written as x to the power 2 minus 4 multiplied by x to the power 2 plus 4. This. And below there, we have a difference of two squares. I suspect that most people tried dealing with it and couldn't because that value there should probably have been something they're used to. So maybe x minus 2 and x plus 2. Now, if you look carefully, you would notice that somewhere here, we could write this particular one as a difference of two squares as well. So we could write it as x plus 2, x minus 2, and x squared plus 4, all divided by x minus 2, x plus 2. That is because these two was like this. 
And so we can take out x plus 2. One minute, we can take out this. And, sorry, not that. I meant this. So this goes. And we are left with this. And this, they go as well. So we are left with x squared plus 4. And we can substitute 2 in there. If we do, we would have 8 for the answer. So generally, we would have such situations. Let's check question 4. Question 4, this can be written as 3x squared plus... I beg your pardon, I'll come back to that. All right, so we, we had a small technical hitch here. So what really is going to happen here is you will just need to factorize and do the divisions, and then we get there. We'll go for a quick break. When we come back, we will just dive a little away from limits, and we will start the process of differentiation and integration. We'll be back.